Happy Saturday morning, everybody. Actually, it's not Saturday. It's Friday night, child, and I'm trying to hurry up and do this good, good video before I watch Lifetime's um, Janet Jackson, because that is first on the list to do over the weekend, right? So I got to hurry up and get this freaker out of the way for you guys so that I can do the on-camera video that I'm going to do for you guys to review the Janet Jackson uh, Lifetime movie. Man, I'm, I'm really hoping that Janet Jackson does not allow Lifetime to F this up for her because you know anything that Lifetime touch and or Wendy Williams touch for the Lifetime is it's basically like mud, you know, but I'm excited. I can't wait to give you guys my uh, insight on the two episode documentary slash adventure. And um, let's get to it. OK, so hello there, love bugs. Hello there, Bellas. If you have not already done so, please remember to like, share to Facebook, subscribe and visit UptopBeauty.com. And if you are not already a part of our book club, please remember to hit the Patreon link below and or the join button here on the YouTube. And for a small monthly fee of five dollars, you babies, yes, sure. you can be privy to all the shenanigans before the YouTube gets it, if the YouTube gets it. Now, let's continue talking about Richard Pryor, prior convictions and other life sentences, the official autobiography. Y'all, y'all probably been waiting on this part since I started this book. But uh, today, we're going to talk about Richard the Pryor and Pam Grew. this together. Roberta Flack introduced me to Atlanta blazed attorney David Franklin, the only black manager I knew of in the business. And I felt as if I'd found the guy who could help me become the hero I envisioned. We couldn't have been more dissimilar. David was straight, upright, and uptight. I was a mess, short fused, paranoid, unpredictable. However, we had a common interest, respect. Both of us wanted it for ourselves and our people. We were, we were going to break down all the barriers as teammates. He'd block, I'd move toward the goal line. The role began during a five week run at the comedy store, my gymnasium, where I began preparing new material for another album. One night between bits, I saw the likeness of an old man I'd seen somewhere else, somewhere in my life, you know? It was as if he were standing beside me on stage, right there, waiting for me to notice. Over here, Rich, look at me. Once I noticed him, inspiration took over. As with other characters, I did like the wino or oil well, I suddenly knew everything about this wise old man who I called Mudbone. Every black town had someone like him, some old geezer who talked shit about his life's experience, fancied himself a philosopher. That first night, I talked about Mudbone for two minutes. A month later, I did a half hour on him alone. I traveled to New York to host Saturday Night Live. In only its first few weeks, the show had emerged like a gunshot blast as the hottest hippest show on TV. Y'all, hold on before I go forward. Man, okay, so hmm, I need y'all help in this when you know how I like you guys. Uh, my favorite cast is not the one with um, Eddie Murphy. It is actually the original prime, prime prime time players. And you know what's crazy about Saturday Night Live? Um, it's so often used as a vehicle for comedians to catapult themselves into, you know, the big time, right? It's not too many people that made it really, really big. You know, give me two minutes, guys. Um, this is where I want you guys to tell me who was your favorite uh, Saturday Night Live cast. 
And this is where I want you to tell me who was your favorite comedian that uh, left Saturday Night Live to do so much better. Of course, everybody in the original primetime players, or what is it, original primetime cast, whatever it is, you know, that would be Gildner Radner, uh, Chevy Chase, Dan Aykroyd, um, all of them, you know, my faves. But I would say the person who I, or the two that I enjoy the most who came from Saturday Night Live would be Adam Sandler. And, um, of, you know, of course, Eddie Murphy, that's a given, but as far as the women is concerned, I said two, but it ended up being three. I would say, uh, Maya Rudolph was her name's daughter, Minnie Ripperton's daughter. Even though SNL's cast members, John Belushi, Chevy Chase, and Dad Aykroyd pushed the envelope each weekend, the show's producers were concerned that I might take it too far, even for them. Well, that's the, how is that possible? How the hell do you know the type of shits that they do over there on the Saturday Night Live? And you think Richard the Pryor won't fit in? Sheesh. Okay. I might take it too far, even for them. During rehearsals, writer Michael O'Donohue came to my hotel room to discuss ideas, but my suggestions scared the heck out of him. And all he could say was, you can't do that on television. See, that's what I'm talking about, I protest, protested, airing my frustration over the constraints of television. Aside from that, I never heard any discussion of censorship. No talk about holding back from anyone, including the cast who gave me the impression they didn't listen to shit anyway. It's true. Them original primetime players, oh my God, I, did, did, they, did they have chaperones or supervisors on that show? I mean, Jim Belushi was, te I mean, terrible. You hear me? I mean, terrible. Um, okay. Aside from that, I never heard a discussion of censorship, not to talk about holding back from any way. One, including the cast who gave me the impression they didn't listen to shit anyway. Behind the scenes, though, the network wrung their hands over the possibility that I might say the word fuck. And, produced, and producer Lorne Michaels, bowing to that concern, secretly installed a five-second delay to the live broadcast, giving NBC a chance to bleep it. If I'd known, I'd have never shown up. What? Y'all get me? I mean, that's the T right there. Because let me find out that five second rule came about because of the Richard Pryor. Now they should have implemented that five second rule long before Richard the Pryor got there. I mean, what, I mean, okay, a funny black comedian come on and now it's a problem. Now you do it when you got the Jim Belushi around here being anything. In any event, I caught the cast enthusiasm and I think it was reflected in the show. Following an opening monologue, my exorcist routine from that niggas crazy Belushi and I traded swipes as samurai bellboys who argued about which one of us got to carry a guest luggage upstairs it ended when I took my sword and cut the front desk in half prompting Belushi in the in the only sentence he'd ever utter in English as that character to say I can see where you're coming from Movies were next, although the Bing. Movies were next, although the bingo long traveling all stars and motor kings car wash man. And silver strength were all box office winners. Each one had its disappointments. Hold on, let me sing my favorite song from Car Wash right quick. Ooh, wop the rat a tat boom, make the sound of the something boom. Ooh, wop. A rat -a -tat boom Hey, make the sound of the something. You got to believe something. Child, that wasn't even on the soundtrack, was it? I don't believe. Wait a minute. Why don't believe in me, 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 me? When Richard Pryor sat down uh, and said, when he said that part, he was like, disrespecting women you don't even know. Sisters, make them play. Man, that Abdullah, man, I thought he was going to kick Richard Pryor's ass. But, you know, Richard Pryor was like, I'm going to drop on down, brother. I'm going to drop on down with a bit of light. Or else I'd be 
you know, making you pay for disrespecting sisters like that. Child, I'm going everywhere, but you know what part I'm talking about. That's pretty much my favorite part in the movie. When, um, you know, the daddy rich limousine comes up, here comes daddy rich in his mean limousine. Hey, people come from everywhere when he's on the scene. Clean can't describe the clothes he wears. He says, all you got to do is believe and you'll get your share. Ow! I wasn't speaking to Billy D. Williams when we did Bingo Long. On the set of Car Shop or Car Wash, I was too coked out to know any better. And after Silver Streak, which began as a minor part but ended as a co-starring role with Gene Wilder, I felt I could have done better. That's profound to me because he's talking about all of the fa- all of my favorite movies with him in there. And y'all, oh my God. You know, I told y'all some kind of hero was my movie, but later we'll discuss it, child. He broke my heart with some kind of hero girl. He broke my heart or gentleman, you know, and then to find out that, you know, anything that Richard Pryor would make with Gene, Gene, um, Wilder, you know, I thought that those two were comedic geniuses together, but he's saying Everything that he did with him was lackluster. That he wasn't even present while making the movies. Joe, you blowing me. He didn't blew me, okay? Um, afterward, and, well, he said that he felt like he could have done better. Those are his words, not mine. I say lackluster, okay? Afterward, I was inundated, inundated, I'm sorry, with scripts. But I worried that my insurgent brand of humor didn't translate as well to the silver screen as I'd hope. Although my funky jive talking characterizations gave credibility to otherwise poorly written cutouts, I still felt limited by the ideas other people had originally created. And in that way, I compromised what I wanted to stand for. But then maybe I was just fooling myself by thinking there was more freedom in movies since I was never going to find an outlet as unrestricted as the stage. Just me, the mic, and the audience. Women, drugs, movies. It doesn't matter. One of the scariest things in life is to get what you wish for. Facts. Towards the end of 1976, producer Hannah Hannah Weinstein asked me to go through the script for Greased Lightning, a film based a film based on the life of a black stock car driver, Wendell Scott. As I sat as I sat on her living room floor, she ticked off the film's different characters as well as the actors she had in mind to play them, including Cleavon Little. I heard his name and assumed he was going to play Scott. Who do you want to who do you want me to play? I asked. She looked at me as if I was stupid. The lead, she said. You're going to play Wendell Scott. Well that fucked me up. Although I complained that the only reason I made stupid films like Car Wash and Silver Streak was because they were the only scripts offered. I was blown away when a movie that seemed to have substance came along and the producers wanted me to star. Was I ready to carry a film? Oh, y'all, I got to hurry up because Janet fitting to hit the stage, baby. The movie was shot in Madison, Georgia. It got off to a rocky start when the original director, Melvin Van Peebles, tried stirring up shit about there not being enough jobs for blacks on the production. His efforts fizzled when I refused to support him. Yeah, because you can't expect a person like uh, 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 um, Richard Pryor, who just want to have a good time, to be serious. You can't expect him to be that way. Plus, he's getting high all over the place. But let me say this, y'all. Ooh, don't tell Mario Van Peebles, okay? But I don't know if y'all feel the same, but Mario Van Peebles has never been an attractive man to me. Never. But his pappy, Melvin, I don't know if it's because Melvin's head wasn't as, I mean, monstrous as Mario's. I don't know, but 
I always thought that the, the father was a very attractive man. I said, man, I got a job. What the F are you talking about? He was replaced by Michael Schultz, who directed Car Wash. Oh, yeah, he did direct Car Wash. It was a nod towards keeping me in line. Though I hadn't been involved, the studio worried about my volatile reputation. I was more concerned about doing a good job. And to that end, I vowed to stay clean throughout the entire movie. I rented a farmhouse on some of the prettiest property I'd ever seen and flew my grandmother out from Peoria to take care of things. Through thick and thin, Mama was like a security blanket for me. She knew the real Richard Pryor. Again, guys, you know we spoke previously about the love of a grandmother. Man, again, Hilda the Great, Mommy, I miss you so much. I love you. I love you. Everybody give your grandmother a shout out in the uh, comments below. I know I be asking y'all to do so much, but man, AJ, man, Annie Jane, man, I love you so much, mommy. I love you so much. And I miss you so much. And I have so many regrets for not spending as much time as I could with you while you was here on earth, mommy. I love you both. Okay, now back to business. Meantime, I hooked I meantime I hooked my co-star, Pam Grew. The first scene was shot. The first scene we shot was romantic. Mm. Meantime, I hooked my co-star, Pam Grew. The first scene we shot was romantic was a romantic one with both of us in the bathtub. I tried to be truly amazing. The director yelled action. Pam sang Amazing Grace in my ear. It was quite a scene. Pam and I stayed together for about six months. After the movie, we went on a romantic getaway to Barbados, where she got deathly ill after eating shellfish. Back home, we enjoyed a much healthier life. We shopped, played tennis, watched TV, and hung out. Unfortunately, our relationship wasn't able to survive Hollywood. Of the two of us, I became the star, but I put off, but I was put off by how much I thought Pam believed that stardom belonged to her. In my head, there was only one numero uno, and it wasn't her. You see that? So this is funny to me because when Pam Greer speaks of her relationship with Richard Pryor, um, she's way more invested into it than he is, you know, from what this book says, you know, basically he like, you know, uh, Pam, you know, I'm, I'm happy that you, you know, want to be a star girl, but between the both of us, you need to bow down and realize that Richard the Pryor is the star girl. Now, yes, you are sexy, but with Sagittarians, it never matters about, um, you know, what a person looks like, you know, it matters in the beginning because, you know, they want to conquer it. Cause I told you Sagittarian men, they are collectors of women. They'll want to, um, get the beauty conquer the beauty, but what do you have to keep his attention? That's the thing. And if it's not, if, if, if your goal is not to sacrifice and bow down to the Sagittarian man, Richard Pryor, then he don't want you girl. You're too busy doing other things. I need you to bow down to me, you know? And then let's talk right quick about the uh, situation with the boogity shuggity found in her vagina. Cause she said she went to the doctor's office and the doctor said, uh, do you realize how much boogity shuggity you got inside your vagina? Now, she was saying that the boogity shuggity that he used so much powder, which is strange to me because he's saying that he was clean during this effort. That's strange. Okay. Now, I don't know if I feel like he's being honest, right? But I really do think that, you know, I don't, I don't really know what to say about Pam Greer because he says he's, you know, he wasn't using now after the movie was over, you know, I, I would think that it's not as much in his system. So for her to say that he had so much boogity shuggity inside of him that it was down there in his prost prostate and 
she allowing him to, you know, release his package into her mailbox. That tells me a lot because if you ain't my husband, don't be releasing your package into my mailbox, girl. I ain't saying I ain't never allow nobody to release their package in my mailbox, but still he, that ninja don't deserve it. So it's just strange to me. I'm like, wait a minute, girl, that just don't even sound right now that I'm reading this book. Like, wait, girl, he said he was clean. Did he have that much bookity sugary in his prostate? That's what, I don't know. That's what she say. I don't know if I can believe that. After Grease Lightning, the pieces fell together. Everyone in town wanted to be in business with me. David Franklin negotiated a separate multi-million dollar deal with Warner Brothers and Universal. I finished Which Way Is Up. In February, Pam and I were sailing on rocky seas. I was pursuing Deborah again, obsessed with, pry with prying her from her older lover. And then I started up with Lucy. Lucy is the interior decorator. It was a circus. Pam was telling people that we were getting married. I was fantasizing about marrying Deborah. And in the meantime, I was hunching Lucy. Ooh, that sounds like a Sagittarius. I never... Never, never. So like back home in 640, we have this guy. Uh, his name is Goodall. He's like, he's a Sagittarian too, but he's like, um, you know, the 640 Prince, you know, he was out there putting in work very early. Okay. And he is definitely a Sagittarian, but I'm telling you, he is like Prince Charming. But child, we all know, girl, don't play with him. He old married man. He got, you know, kid, well not kids, a child and everything, y'all. I'm telling you, you know, nobody takes him for serious. And if you do, you will, you, you should know better than to take him serious because, you know, he is a Sagittarian man that has a lot of range, a lot of reach child. And you just, you just know that he has women. So for anybody to take a character like Richard Pryor serious, it's like you just, you, you asking for it, man. You are truly asking for it. Even if he pursue you for years, girl, he won't get sick of you. Cause that's what they do. The press said many things about me bringing the new black superstar. Hold on. The press said many things about me being the new black superstar. Only one thing was certain. It wasn't even being Richard Pryor. After that movie, Blue Collar, which Paul Schrader wrote in about, about two days, especially for me and Harvey Cartel, I went straight into production on my own weekly comedy variety series on NBC. Y'all, I love them little specials that they used to do. It was weakness. The day after a plane flew over my house towing a sign that said, Surrender Richard, I let myself be swayed into going ahead with the TV series. Though I got NBC to, to agree to reduce the number of shows from 10 to 4. The less is better, okay? Because he don't trust himself. Uh-uh. You know them Sagittarians got to be free. Sagittarians and Libras, you know we got to be free. Uh-uh. Don't commit me to nothing, uh-uh, because I might change my mind in the middle of the deal. And then you're going to be mad at me, and I'm not going to give a fuck. He said he might as well had just taped his personal life for what was going on. Now, that would have been, you know, a comedy of errors in itself. He said, although Richard is, Richard is in love with Jennifer, he proposes to Deborah. I thought Pam Greer said she was marrying you, Deborah said. She did. I replied. On September 18th, Lily Tomlin invited me to appear at a star-studded gay rights benefit at the Hollywood Bowl. By the time I walked on stage, I was out of control. I was drunk, stoned, and incensed at what I perceived to be the mistreatment of a black singing group compared to some of the white acts on the bill. Mm. Ooh. Mm. I was the talk of Hollywood the next day. I pissed off everyone from studio heads to head, to head waiters. Lily tried excusing my behavior or at least explaining it by saying, when you hire Richard Pryor, you get Richard. I know that's right. 
I know that's right, girl. The night before Richard marries Deborah, he pulls Jennifer into the bathroom and starts kissing and groping her. See the bullshit? You see the bullshit? You're getting married, right? Jenny asked, confused but not resisting, and in the factual act, in fact, already in love with me. Oh my god, this girl's in love with him. Child, go, oh my goodness. Now, just to clarify a little more, remember the interior decorator, Lucy? Who he hunching? Lucy has an assistant named Jennifer. He's supposed to be getting married, but he messing around. Oh, wait a minute. Who did he ask to get married? Because this is it. He was supposed to be marrying Pam Greer because that's what Pam Greer is telling everybody. Okay. But he had just, uh, Deborah said she did. He had just asked who to marry him. Hold on y'all. He had just asked Deborah to marry him. Okay. But he claims to be in love with Lucy, one of the other girls he hunches, assistant, Jennifer, Jenny. Ooh, child, he got a lot going on. The night before Richard marries Deborah, he pulls Jennifer into the bathroom and starts kissing and groping. <coughs> Sorry, y'all. And groping her. You getting married, right? Jenny asked, confused but not resisting, and in fact already in love with him. I mean, goddamn girl. Supposed to be, I replied, lifting her dress. So how come you're kissing me like this? It was a good question. I wanted to possess Deborah, but I wanted to know Jennifer. She knew famous actors and musicians. She'd seen things. She'd been there, you know, and I envied that. I guess I wanted it all, was my final answer. Before we got any further, Deborah came home. Right away, she smelled trouble. Sniffed the funny business before she could go upstairs. She wanted to fire Jenny, but I planned it, oh, but I played it smooth, saying that was fine with me. But then she'd have to take over the redecorating, knowing Deborah was a grandiose bitch who never did a day's work in her life. I prayed that she would react in a character, and she did, like a bitch. Well, maybe we should keep her around just to finish up, she said. Oh, good idea, I replied. Okay. The wedding if you can call such a spectacle that took place the next day. Barely, I was drunk. My daughter Elizabeth wore black. Pam Greer showed up uninvited. And Deborah, the bride who was an hour late and had to be revived after taking too many quaaludes, said, thank God you were drunk when I got there. Because if you'd seen what I looked like. The following morning, I showed up on the set of the Richard Pryor show, still wearing my wedding tux, ready to tape the third of the fourth show. By then, I was already resigned to failure. Not only were we pitted against Happy Days and Laverne and Shirley, the two top-rated shows, but the network censors thwarted me from the get-go. On the very first show, they refused to air the opening bit, a close-up of me reporting how delighted I was to have my own show. Damn, how they, why would they knock that out? Why would they do that? That's dumb. I imagined resting when Debbie and I finally honeymooned in Maui, but it was nothing to put on a postcard home. I spent the first night drunk and covered with vomit in a shower while I complained about the awful conditions of the bungalow we had reserved. It was old, there were bugs, and the hotel didn't provide room service. Are we going to eat corn are we going to eat cornflakes for a week? Deborah asked. I attempted to redeem myself the next evening by going to the grocery store and cooking fried chicken, mashed potatoes, and corn on the cob. But it was a temporary reprieve. At the end of October, the craziness began all over again when I went to work on the Wiz in New York. I couldn't help myself. 
I caroused with sleazies, doped up, no good nicks all night. I was as lit as the white suit I wore playing the Wiz himself. I answered my wake-up calls by saying, oh shit, I made it again. Damn, he was messed up on the Wiz? Oh my goodness, the Wiz? Mm. I didn't, re- I didn't realize the extent to which I was weak, wreaking havoc on my system and jeopardizing my health until I went to Peoria in early November for my grandmother's 78th birthday. The fall weather was brisk and energizing, but I was wiped out. Too many drugs, too little sleep, too much work, too many problems. Now, if you have not already done so, please remember to like, share to Facebook, subscribe, and visit uptopbeauty.com. Now, remember this. The same people that you meet on the way up will always be the same people that you meet on the way down. My naysayers, my patron loves. You babies, have a good one. Peace.